Okay. So in the long run, at the modern, you produce cost efficient, where the long run average cost is at the minimum, and where you have a price P star when the mod is exactly equal to supply and Q capital Q star is what you produce and if this example is oil then P star is around for the time being hundred and five dollars a barrel and Q star is around 19 million barrels a day that is equilibrium just the actual numbers and what you will have later on is to deal with numbers the real price the real quantity and market equilibrium hmm? so far long run average long run marginal cost curve within the oil sector that is the important one for the Norwegian economy huh? so this curve is really relevant in this course watch up huh, huh. next picture when for economics consumer surplus producer surplus figure 3-5 Go to figure 3 five. This is my field. My research is within welfare economics. I do cost benefit analysis and I've done that since 1975. That is my main topic, welfare economics. That's my research field. And that's where I started in 1975. What is meant by consumer surplus? That is the triangle ABC. If we have a supply curve, the marginal cost curve, and demand curve, and market equilibrium in point C, then we have that the triangle ABC is consumer surplus. And that is what the consumers are willing to pay in addition to what they actually pay. They pay 40. And the consumer surplus here is 80 minus 40 multiplied by 50 divided on 2. And you will see that that is around 1000. That is consumer surplus. And that is the welfare reason for developing a perfect competitive system. It is for the benefit of the consumers through consumer surplus. So the reason for doing it is that triangle. The red triangle is the producer surplus. That is what's left for the producers. And it's the same the same topic you just have forty minus twenty multiplied by fifty divided on two. That is what the producers will have from producing these goods totally. And these two triangles is the welfare gain that we have from this perfect competitive market where you produce 40 I mean you have price 40 and you produce 50 units and as you can see there will be no other quantity than 50 that will give that maximum area 
A, C, D. So, in a welfare sense, we maximize welfare by striving for a perfect competitive system. It's so elegant. But, again, a reminder, we did not include external effects, and we did not include the problem with the income distribution. So, efficiency in a market sense, okay, but for our economic system, you need to take into consideration external effects and income distribution. And that's the main motivation for regulations. Okay? Can you see that? I can see that it's not that easy now to follow me. <laughs> You have been listening to me for a long while, but just keep on going. <laughs> it will be a little bit more complicated when I turn into the next figure. So, take a deep breath and be patient <laughs> and just listen. Next figure. This is not in the textbook. It was in an earlier version, but the authors have dropped it in the new version. Because it's not that important in the US economy, and this one, this is a really important one for Norway, not for the US. And Instead of market in the United States, you definitely say market in Norway. Huh. And to the right hand side, you say market in the rest of the world. So, to start this figure, and we have taken copies from my old textbook, <coughs> and these copies have been sent to you, and they will be available at Fronto. Last year, this figure, I think it was last year, was a part of the final exam. Huh, huh. And this is what we gain from trade. This is to understand in a welfare context, what we gain from trade in a world where we have a perfect competitive international market. So, let's start from the left hand side on the field. We have the demand curve for Norway. <laughs> Here it is US, Norway. And we have the supply curve. U.S. here, it's meant Norway. And if we do exactly what we do within the farming industry, we protect our market, we just use tariffs and protections that don't allow any exploitation from France, from Africa, from Croatia, when it concerns food, we protect our own market. What will be the market solution? That's always where the demand curve intersects with the supply curve. Price equal to P4, quantity Q2. That's under a regime of protection. And there, we have 
consumer surplus, the area A, producer surplus, the area B, and you add to producer surplus, the area D. That is what the producers are. Then, Hmm? Why we don't add also the area under D as a... I come to that. Come to that. Uh. Okay, it's a good question. Uh. So you're really awake. Uh. 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 That's nice to see. If we now return to that figure at the left hand side, at the right hand side. We start with the market in the rest of the world. What is the equilibrium in the market in the rest of the world? It is price P2. That is the market price P2 in the rest of the world. Decided by demand and supply. Then it's demand, rest of the world, supply, rest of the world. And the international market price is P2, and market equilibrium, Q2. And what you can observe is that the market price is lower internationally than in the protected system in Norway. Just as we know, if you go and buy food in Norway, <laughs> it's quite expensive. Why come? We just protect our farmers. We don't allow for low price import. We keep the prices high, and you are not allowed to export anything to Norway. And then drive the prices downward and just close our market. Why come? We love the farmers. <laughs> that is, we were all farmers some generations ago. I have my family located just outside Norway with a farm that place is called Hagvik, huh. and was that when I was young, all my summers, I was there. And of course, since I know that I once was a farmer, <laughs> I just say that, help the farmers. Just give heavy subsidies to the farmers. It was not long ago. Since I had my youth in all my summer holidays in Havik, just outside Stavanger. So, when the economists say that why come, this is not Russian, I say, I agree. But still I say, I love the farmers. <laughs> Let them just be a part of that system where they will have a salary that is high enough that some people will just go on being farmers. That's not easy. Why not? Because all the farmers are young guys that can always have a job offshore. <laughs> and the wage difference going offshore earning a million, a million kroners a year compared to what you earn by being a farmer is enormous. It's enormous. So it's very tempting for all the farmers to leave and start offshore because they're young and they're strong and they earn much more. So I just say, let's just pay them heavily to have some people being willing to stay as farmers. Does it mean that 
means that uh, Norway import only the food it can be produced. Only that food that can't be produced. Banana <laughs> and cheese from France and something else. But most of all, we produce everything from the Norwegian farming industry. And this is again in the textbook. If you read the textbook, they tell you that one example of a perfect competitive system is the farming industry <laughs> in US, not in Norway. F the farming industry is the most regulated sector in Norway. I have studied these regulations for many years, and still I don't understand them. <laughs> so this is the part of industrial organization that I don't understand. It is the complex regulation of the farming industry. And this is a case for industrial organization where I have colleagues at Norwegian School of Economics in Bergen. They study this sector and it's so complex that I don't really follow that research. It's too complicated of a regulation. So okay, that was just some reflections. But then to move further, what happens now if we just say that we change our system and we open up for import? What happens? Then you can easily see that if the price will be P3, how much will the rest of the world export to Norway? Q3 minus Q1. Can you see that? If the price will be P3, the supply is Q3 and the demand from the rest of the world is Q1. So they just export Q3 minus Q1. If we just move that into the figure at the left hand side, you see that you will have a shift in the supply curve. It's just a shift downwards in the supply curve. And that difference, Q3 minus Q1, is just equal to capital Q1 minus capital Q1, capital Q3 minus capital Q1. Can you see that? And then, with the shift in the supply curve, because now we have exporters from Africa, from Croatia, <laughs> from Germany, from France, from Denmark, the curve shifts downward. For every price level, you will have a higher supply. What is the new market equilibrium? That is where demand Norway intersects with the new supply curve. Q3. So, we eat more cheese from France and more vegetables from Croatia mm. and more bananas from Africa and therefore we move from Q2, capital Q2 to capital Q3. Can you see that? Who is the winner? Can you see the consumer surplus? The consumer. Ah. The consumers are the winners. And that's me. That's me. I will win. But I will just say that, okay, I win. 
but my salary is high enough. <laughs> so I just leave that as an income for the farmers. But in a perfect competitive system, if we open the borders and we leave the market equilibrium to be decided by the international price level, we end up with the price P3, quantity Q3, and instead of consumer surplus A, you add consumer surplus B and consumer surplus C. Consumer surplus B, that is what you steal from the producers. While the red area is the welfare gain. So, with an international market, the only small piece left for the producers as producer surplus is the area T. T. So the losers will be the farmers, the winners, or the consumers. But in addition to that, what about Croatia, France, Africa? They will win too. Why come? Because now they can export to much higher prices and they will have extra profit. And for me, that is the good part of it. So, in the long run, Norway will be put into pressure to change our policy in this area, to open up our borders, to import from other countries. We will not be allowed to operate as a very, very international oriented market, but in this area, we just close our borders hmm. and act as if we were just Okay. This is what the authors left out. Export and import is not important for US. Not that important because it's a very big country. They export to China, they export to Europe, and they import. But their internal market in their big country is much more important than import and export. But for Norway, this is an important figure. Because we have a very, very international oriented market. So the text to these two figures, you'll find at Fonta. Read it. Next picture. Monopoly. Figure 3-6. This is the nice one. If you have a monopoly, you always move along the demand curve. And if you are at point A, how can you move and change your profit? You just have to consider two perspectives. If you are going to increase the quantity, you will have to lower your price from P1 to P2. And then you move from Q1 to Q1 plus 1. Can you see that? So the gain is what you gain by producing one unit more. And that gain is equal to the price P2. Why come? Because it's one unit and the price level is P1, P2. So P2 is what you gain. What do you lose? You lose exactly how much will you have to reduce your price 
P1 down to P2 for all the consumers. For at the margin, one more consumer would be willing to pay that product, what it costs. So, to have that gain, the gray area, you have to offer the loss, the red area. This is the trade-off for the monopolist. And this is always the trade-off for the monopolist. Okay? They will have to move along the demand curve. And consider that they have power, they can put the prices at that level where they maximize the marginal revenue equal to marginal cost. But the marginal revenue now will have to consider two parts, loss and gain. While the marginal revenue in a perfect competitive system was the price. Here you have to consider the loss. Hmm. Then going back, then we move to the linear demand curve. Marginal revenue is equal to A minus BQ minus BQ. Figure 3-7, twice that steeple. Yeah. You see the modern cost curve. And when you have a linear demand curve, you see the demand curve. And you just go home and do that exercise for yourself. When you look for the modern revenue or ha and have a linear demand curve, the marginal revenue curve will start exactly where the demand curve intersects with the, with the vertical axis and it will be twice as steep. And that is the rule that I will have to tell you over and over and over again the twice as steep rule. That is when you have power you have a linear demand curve, you always move along the marginal revenue curve. And remember that, that is the curve that twice as steep, and you end up maximizing your profit where the marginal revenue curve intersects with the marginal cost curve. That is quantity QM, and the price the monopolist will take is PM. Hmm? So they move, if we have had a perfect competitive system, we have had the intersection, the market equilibrium, where the marginal cost curve intersect with the demand curve but the monopolist move along the demand curve upwards until it reaches the level PM and Y because at the price level PM is exactly where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost they maximize profit and all the monopolists do that for instance if we have one airline company that will be responsible for the transportation between Monta and Oslo, if there will be only one, they will do exactly as in this figure. They will maximize their profit and the prices will be very high. Have you tried now to travel during the week between Monta and Oslo, you will easily see now that the price level that the airline companies will take 
It's very, very hard. Do you know why? Now is when these two companies have power. Because we are just developing this gas field at Okra. We are investing 15 billion Norwegian kroners in that plant. And the people that will be hired to do the job, they will come from Stavanger, from Stoll and Bergen, and they use the airplane. And therefore, now the prices to go from Malta to Oslo, if you travel when this workforce will need the capacity, you can't afford it. So it's for you, as long as this construction work will go on, you will just have to find unconventional schedules <laughs> and travel just when these people don't want to travel. <laughs> Sunday morning or Saturday evening. Or but if you try to travel during the week, it's very, very costly. And they act as a monopolist. Now discount, very expensive, and you just have to adapt to that. So if you want to visit your friends in Oslo, you have to travel by car. <laughs> Take a car. Huh? The train is okay. It's okay. And the bus is okay. But the planes, much too expensive. For me, when I travel to my export, export group, the Ministry of Finance will pay. <laughs> and they have a lot of money. <laughs> so I don't bother. Okay, next one. This one just shows you that the elasticity of demand is important. And in the left hand side A, the elasticity is high. The prices will be lower. And to the right hand side, the elasticity is low. That is when you have market power. So the elasticity tells you how much power you have. And since the airline company just can increase their prices, and they will just see that even though the price level will be 3,000, the people traveling to work out there in the oil field, they just pay. So the elasticity will be so low that therefore the prices will increase. But if the elasticity in, in real terms will be high, if you try to increase your price, you will be close to perfect competition. With elasticity like minus 0 0.3, you have market power. With an elasticity equal to minus 3, you don't have market power. So the elasticity is now introduced for the first time. That is the learner index telling you that going back. Hmm. A monopoly markup. Price minus marginal cost divided by price. How much you in percentage deviate from marginal cost is, de is, is decided by minus 1 over the price elasticity. So if the price elasticity is high, the difference, if the price elasticity in, in real terms is high, you end up 
with price being equal to marginal cost. The higher the elasticity, the closer you are to a perfect competitive system. Then we go to 3A. Next one. 3 9 is easy to read. Just tells you the difference between monopoly and perfect competition. Perfect competition, you end up in point B. In, in monopoly, you end up in point F. The prices will increase. You can read that in the textbook. Next one. And if you have a monopoly that will end up being less efficient because they don't com they don't compete with any anyone else, they will be less efficient. Then this figure will show you that the welfare loss might be very, 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 very high. Therefore, the real welfare loss is when you have a monopoly that is not under pressure to produce efficient. That is when it's costly. Next one. And this is discounting. And this is a piece of cake for you. The only thing you I need to remind you is that if you have profit in infinity, the net present value is equal to profit per year divided by the discount factor. Just remember that formula. Profit per year divided by the discount factor. That is to discount to present value. That is shown in the textbook. And exactly one minute to four Mm. We have just ended chapter 3. Good timing. <laughs>